Hello colleagues, welcome to the 2021 Labour 7 Summit. Before we start, we need to run over some housekeeping. Firstly, some useful tools for you. The digital agenda is your personalised agenda for the day. To enter your sessions, you simply click on the session when it's starting. The resource gallery is home to event-related content. Please navigate to it from your digital agenda page. Here you will find supporting documents for the event. We have scheduled networking time planned at the end of the day. Please head over to the meeting hub at this time where you can use the instant chat and messaging functions and request meetings with other attendees, which, once scheduled, will show up in your digital agenda. You can download the contact details of any attendees you network and connect with by clicking the export button at the top right of the platform before the virtual event ends. To make the most of this function, and of course if you want to, you can add in your LinkedIn and contact details to your profile. Here on the main stage, the discussion forum is available for general comments between attendees. Please use this space to discuss and feedback on the topics of the session. The Q&A function is to submit questions to the panel. You can upvote the best or most relevant questions. If you are having technical issues, please keep the discussion forum clear for session discussion and email all technical and programming queries to event support at cabinetoffice.gov.uk for support. Cet événement se déroulera en anglais. L'interprétation simultanée en français sera assurée via Interaxio. Pour y accéder, saisir l'adresse app.interaxio.io dans une nouvelle fenêtre de votre navigateur. Entrez le code de réunion L72021 et sélectionnez la langue pour entendre l'interprétation en direct sur votre appareil. Les instructions d'utilisation étape par étape pour toute personne souhaitant accéder à ce service sont disponibles dans la galerie de ressources de l'événement. Please be aware all main stage sessions are being recorded. For the best viewing experience, we recommend you go full screen. Thank you very much for your attention and we hope you enjoy the day. Good morning everybody. Welcome to this uh... L7 session on climate change and a just transition. We've got some great speakers for you today. Uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, Tara Peel, Sue Wilshire, Sharon Burrow, who I'll introduce in turn. Uh, and we'll also have a little bit of time for questions and answers. So please do start posting your questions now. Uh, the global trade union movement's commitment to cut carbon, reach our targets, is second to none. And we know that it needs bold action, interventionist and internationalist. We also recognise there are big opportunities too, uh, in green jobs and healthier lives. And we want to see a fair share of the benefits of that green dividend going to ordinary working people. But we also need to recognise that our track record on big change hasn't always worked for working people. Certainly in the UK, if you think back to the 1980s, uh, a lot of communities suffered greatly. A lot of people lost their jobs uh, and communities were hit hard. So we need an equal voice in shaping the programme of transition and recognising that it's not just a case of out with the old, in with the new. It's also about how we transform jobs, firms um, and parts of the economy that will continue uh, to flourish, we hope, in a low carbon economy. President Biden, of course, has set out a very ambitious plan for green growth and infrastructure and for a more equal distribution of wealth and power. Yesterday, uh, it was reported that the president has just set up a task force to promote union organizing. And that's a great link to our first speaker, who is Kwasi Kwarteng. Uh, Kwasi is the uh, Secretary of State for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And I know a passionate advocate of tackling climate change. So over to you, Kwasi. Thank you so much, uh, Francis, and it's really good to see you again. And of course, it's a great honour uh, to be able to address this forum uh, in this way. I think the subjects that we're uh, discussing could not be more 
uh, important. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's a great honor for me to be able to sketch out what I think uh, the government's doing, what we're doing as a, as a community, as a country, uh, and the kind of leadership that we seek uh, to demonstrate in this area. Um, as you will know, uh, this year is a really important year for the United Kingdom, because of course, we have the presidency of the G7, uh, and there will be events uh, in the next, uh, in the coming months uh, related to that. And of course, we have the COP26 presidency, uh, where we will be hosting COP26 uh, in Glasgow uh, this November. So both of these responsibilities are hugely important uh, to us and couldn't have come at a more uh, timely and important uh, uh, time. 2021 will indeed, is indeed, a critically uh, important year to accelerate uh, the international agenda on climate change. And given the devastation that COVID has wrought internationally, uh, as well as in our own communities, a green, uh, resilient and inclusive recovery is at the heart uh, of our G7 presidency and also, uh, I think, uh, very relevant to COP26 as well. Uh, and I think Francis uh, makes the point that uh, recoveries uh, need to be inclusive. We need to think in a more holistic way about uh, economic recovery. And I think that uh, a green recovery from uh, what has happened uh, in the last year is absolutely essential. I think there have been great strides, actually. Uh, when I look back over the last two years, I was made uh, Minister of State for Energy two years ago. I think there has been uh, some progress uh, uh, that we've seen. Uh, only uh, last October, China, uh, which is one of the uh, carbon emitters, committed themselves for the first time to a net zero target uh, by 2060, albeit it's not as soon as 2050, which we think is paramount. But this was the first time that the Chinese government had such a target, and I think that was hugely significant. On top of that, we've seen uh, colleagues uh, in Japan uh, commit to net zero by 2050, and also uh, South Korea, uh, really only a couple of weeks after the Chinese announcement, uh, committed themselves uh, to a net zero uh, target by 2050. So as I speak, all of the G7 countries are now committed uh, to net zero by 2050. And we are encouraging them, as they have done, to set out ambitious uh, carbon emission reduction targets uh, for 2030. And of course, it's not just about uh, reducing emissions, vitally important though that is. It is also about trying to make sure that we can drive economic growth in a much more sustainable way uh, than has been the case in the past. And on that note, I think the green recovery is really a unique opportunity uh, to address the UK's long term uh, economic uh, challenges. You will have heard about uh, leveling up uh, the attempt to widen economic opportunities across the United Kingdom. I think that uh, the Prime Minister's 10 point plan that was announced uh, in November last year is very much uh, part of that agenda. And in the 10 point plan, as many of you will know, there were commitments uh, uh, to offshore wind, commitments to hydrogen production, uh, commitments uh, to carbon capture, which uh, if we can pursue as we are, uh, will lead to a, a huge range of new jobs and new employment opportunities, new skills uh, that, the, uh, that our economy requires. And I think the 10 point plan also points to the potential for uh, enjoying and, and building on export opportunities uh, as well. So this is not only an environmental program, uh, which is absolutely crucial. It is also a program for economic recovery and a more inclusive uh, way of growing prosperity uh, across the world and in the United Kingdom. And Francis alluded to my commitment uh, in this area. Uh, and of course, uh, as I was a Minister of State for Energy before being appointed uh, Secretary of State, I was very pleased uh, to launch a Green Jobs Task Force, uh, which is now being chaired by Anne-Marie Trevelyan uh, and my other colleague, uh, Gillian Keegan. 
and we're working with task force members, a number of whom I think are uh, with us virtually, uh, members from the TUC, uh, from industry, and also uh, skills providers uh, to help us develop plans which can support these new, uh, long-term, good quality uh, green jobs. And that's something, as I say, of critical uh, importance. I'm pleased to say that the task force will publish its recommendations uh, in the next couple of months. And of course, these will feed in directly to the net zero strategy, which uh, our department, my department here and colleagues here are publishing uh, later this year. And I think the net zero strategy flowing as it does uh, from the Prime Minister's 10 point plan and of course, the energy white paper will actually sketch out uh, uh, more uh, detail, uh, flesh out more detail about how we intend uh, to transition to a net zero economy. I'm very pleased uh, that under my uh, the, the leadership of my friend and, for, and colleague here in Bay, his former colleague, Alok Sharma, uh, the COP presidency is really gathering momentum. And I think uh, the COP, our COP presidency, will absolutely benefit from the support and encouragement of the International Labour Organization. Uh, we are uh, very keen to bring out a set of principles uh, that we hope uh, countries and development banks uh, will adopt in order to accelerate and realize uh, the international uh, an international uh, just transition to a net uh, zero economy. Uh, these principles will cover everything uh, from the quality of new jobs uh, created through international projects. And it will also, I think, create forums where we can uh, discuss, uh, communities can discuss uh, ways in which we can pursue uh, this agenda to arrive at a more sustainable and greener future. We'll be working uh, across uh, uh, the international community uh, to embed these principles in our own international uh, climate uh, discussions and also thinking about uh, uh, funding streams, which uh, we hope will, uh, will encourage the, a just transition. Just finally, I'd like to thank uh, the L7 for recognizing the vital importance of climate in any discussion about the future of work uh, and the future of our communities, and also for their help uh, in working with the government on the Employment Task Force, uh, which will prepare our labor markets uh, for 2030. This government uh, that I am a member of is committed to making the UK the best uh, place in the world to work and grow uh, a business. But that growth uh, we fully recognize needs to be more sustainable. It needs to be greener. In short, it needs to be just better uh, than much of the economic growth we've seen uh, in the last 150 years. Thank you very much for listening to my remarks. And of course, I'm very much uh, looking forward uh, to answering questions, uh, any questions that you may uh, pose me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Quaz. Um, I'm pretty sure that there will be plenty of questions about what we do in practical terms to raise labour standards and living standards so that we win support for the green change that we need to see. Um, our next speaker is Tara Peel. Uh, she's the National Coordinator for Health, Safety and the Environment at the Canadian Labour Congress. Uh, Tara also has many other feathers in her cap from the task force on um, coal to Canada's uh, Climate Action Network. Uh, you're very welcome, Tara. Over to you. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about Canada's experience with just transition in the phase out of coal in our electricity sector. Uh, the labor movement in Canada supported Canada's commitment to phasing out coal-fired electricity uh, generation by 2030, despite the impact it would have on our members' jobs. We supported it because it was the right thing to do for the health of our planet, and it was the right thing to do for the health of Canadians. But we were clear that affected workers and their communities must not be expected to shoulder the burden of this phase out alone. Uh, I was proud to serve on Canada's Just Transition Task Force for Canadian coal power workers and communities. 
we began our work in the spring of 2018, immediately setting out across the country, holding meetings and town halls in communities that produce coal-fired power. We met with affected workers and their unions, employers in the industry, local governments and chambers of commerce and community economic development groups. And we listened. We listened to their hopes and fears and to their plans for the future. We heard what they need from their government to successfully transition out of the coal industry. Despite their uncertainty and their frustrations about what their futures might hold, these communities welcomed us. Workers expressed their fears that a green energy transition may not provide the good job paying jobs that support their families and communities in the way that their current jobs do. Our recommendations to government centered on the idea that affected workers must be involved in these decisions and communities must be able to shape their own plans for the transition. And despite having a variety of voices on the task force, including a former CEO of a utility company with coal assets, a city councillor from an affected community, environmentalists, and strong representation from the unions representing coal workers, our recommendations to government were unanimous. Workers need access to reskilling and income supports as they transition to new employment, and they need pathways to a dignified retirement for those nearing the end of their careers. And communities centered around the industry need investments to create new job opportunities, which will help them to survive and thrive after the coal plants close. And we need to make sure that those new jobs, whether they are in clean energy or other sectors, are good jobs. This, of course, is a work in progress. In the time since the task force has finished our work, we welcomed federal budget commitments to supporting coal communities with regional economic development funding. There are still a number of recommendations from the task force that have not yet been acted on. Uh, our work with these workers, our, our work on the task force was largely, you know, in part, building trust with these workers that they wouldn't be left to figure this out on their own, that as we make this necessary transition towards a net zero economy, that affected workers won't be asked to shoulder the burden of that shift on their own. We have to make good on that promise. Uh, Canada recently struck a net zero advisory body to support our climate accountability legislation. Hassan Youssef, the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, uh, sits on that body and will bring the voice of workers to that group. Just transition is a key driver of ambition on the path to net zero. And we are keen to work with the federal government uh, on just transition legislation so that workers are at the table with their employers and governments to ensuring a jobs rich transition to a net zero economy. Because if we are going to meet our goals of limiting warming to no more than 1.5 degrees, as we know is urgent and needed, we need to do more than just give advice. We need concrete plans followed by action with workers at the table shaping that net zero future, a future where all jobs are green and decent and pathways for affected workers to get to those new jobs uh, in the sectors uh, that will need to grow. And so I think I will leave it there. Thank you for the opportunity to join you. I also am looking forward to answering questions um, uh, as we move to that phase of the of the panel. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Tara. And um, yes, please do start posting those uh, questions for the panel. Um, our next speaker is Sue Wilshire. Um, and uh, Sue is uh, uh, from a major international development charity called Tear Fund. Uh, she's leading their work on climate change policy. You're very welcome, Sue. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be welcomed at the L7 conference. And last week I was at the C7 and helped to develop those civil society asks on climate and environment. So as a result of this coronavirus crisis, the social contract is changing. Our interconnectedness has never been clearer. And around the world, health systems are stretched to breaking point. There have been huge job losses. Millions face financial uncertainty. And sadly, the progress made against extreme poverty and hunger is being undone. So we face a turning point in history for a once in a generational opportunity for jobs rich, climate safe and equitable economic recovery. And for this, we need strong and collaborative global leadership. So through the G7, COP26 and the G20, the UK alongside Italy has the opportunity to crack the crises we face globally on health, climate, poverty and nature. So in this pivotal year on climate change, what the G7 delivers is crucial. 
And I am encouraged by the favourable winds for greater political commitments. And, gold, and climate change is the golden thread through the political landscape this year. We've already seen some G7 nations raise their ambition, set the bar high, including the UK ending direct support to fossil fuels overseas and now setting its emissions reduction target to 78% by 2035. The US is also back in the race to tackle climate change, having doubled its emissions reduction target. However, even with these and other commitments in recent months, we're still way off track to limit global temperatures to the safer levels of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Because after so many years of dither, delay, and climate inaction, greenhouse gas emissions now need to reduce swiftly and sharply, not waiting for a net zero date in the future, but making the right decisions and taking action now. So seizing this unique moment we now face to integrate climate policy and economic policy, to spur an equitable and green recovery is a political responsibility, I believe the highest order. And much of that is rests on the shoulders of the G7. The UK, as we've already heard, um, you know, is a good example of a country that has reduced its emissions whilst growing its economy. Much of that progress was through cutting our reliance on coal. And we now face deeper changes that will affect the way we go about our lives. The decarbonisation strategies for housing, transport are as yet delayed and policies to recover coronavirus are inconsistent across government. And on the one hand, my fellow panellists, the Secretary of State Department has committed to some genuine world leading policies, such as banning the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. But we also see this contrasted with commitments to freeze fuel duty for 11th year in a row or plan to cut air passenger duty on domestic flights without the necessary green strings that we need. So we're not yet seeing the determination and ambition to green our recovery across all departments. And I don't think we have to choose between green recovery and economic recovery has been noted already. And for example, dollar for dollar, investments in renewables creates three and a half times more jobs than investments in fossil fuels do. There should be no new fossil fuels in G7 nations and all G7 nations should join the UK in ending public support for fossil fuels overseas and instead invest rapidly in scaling up clean energy sources and energy efficiency. So now is the time for G7 nations to build back better, but also to lead an economic wide transformation, supporting the transition to climate friendly jobs. And in 2018, when the G7 was hosted by Canada, this was recognised the importance of a just transition for workers, communities and indigenous peoples. We now need to see this as a standing priority agenda for the G7. Considerations to include partnering with affected workers, tap into their expertise, participate in the policy planning that affects them most. Prioritise investment in skills and infrastructure and training and streamline that training to enable workers to move more easily across industries. And support to a just transition doesn't just apply to G7 nations. There's an urgent need to significantly scale up climate finance for vulnerable countries, and for 50% of that at least, to help countries adapt to the impacts of the climate crisis already unfolding. And more investment is needed to help those countries leapfrog dirty industries, just like they did from landlines to mobile phones. Otherwise, we risk further harm to the people who have done the least to cause climate change, but already feeling its devastating impacts. So what does a green economy look like in the types of countries that Tier Fund works in? Well, I hear of exciting entrepreneurial endeavours of small scale green jobs, such as one community in Malawi who's moved from deforestation for charcoal production to beekeeping as a way to protect and enhance biodiversity, as well as generate income from selling honey. Or the communities in Uganda aiming to be zero waste, collecting discarded plastic to make eco bricks, which are used in the construction of paving slabs, fence posts, or even PPE. So I do believe that the changes we need to see, although far reaching, are possible. And it's imperative that the G7 nations step up and take action, implementing policies for a green and equitable recovery that crack the multiple crises we face of health, 
poverty, climate and nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Our final speaker in the lineup uh, today is Sharon Burrows. Uh, no stranger to many of you, Sharon has been General Secretary of the International TUC since 2010. From Australia, so she knows a thing or two about the urgency of climate change, but she's representing all working people worldwide in looking for that just transition. Sharon, you're very welcome. Thank you, Fran. Thank you to the TUC for your action on, uh, on this vital question. There's no doubt that climate ambition and just transition is central for a just recovery and for the resilience against future shocks from extreme weather events. It's the foundation also of a new social contract for working people and their families everywhere. Jobs, good jobs, union jobs with human and uh, labour rights with living wages and the freedom to organise and bargain collectively, along with social protection to support people in times of crisis. That's at the heart of the framework for a just transition. There's no doubt for the union movement that to stabilise the planet with net zero economies by 2050, we must get more than half the job done by 2030. The Secretary of State said today that the UK is ambitious and we acknowledge the UK's commitment indeed to do 75% uh, by 2030. That's a really ambitious and a necessary commitment to the world. But we urge you to plan this transition with unions at the table, with the TUC, with the other unions in key industries. That's the thing that will build trust as we cannot repeat past transitions in the UK or any other G7 or indeed uh, any country that have left workers and their communities stranded. The Labour movement fought and won for just transition rules, first at the ILO and then in the Paris Agreement. Essentially, this means that workers and their unions must be at the table when we plan for transition. We know that it means in every sector. The foundation of the future is clean energy. It's not about brown or green, but all technologies must be deployed to actually ensure that manufacturing, transport, agriculture, construction, services, and meeting the test of climate ambition and just transition. We know that our cities are a vital part of the equation with responsibility for more than 40% of emissions and that demand and supply relationship from those cities can generate uh, sustainable production and services to fuel community renewal with decent work in rural communities in our own countries or indeed around the world. We need to see, of course, global trade reform to meet the same sustainability standards with human and labour rights and compliance respected so that we can have a future that is indeed about justice and transition for all workers. We also know that good paying jobs in a, in a transition will require training for hundreds of thousands of workers. So when you think about what does just transition means, it's very simple. It actually means that we uh, make sure that workers are involved in the plans to transition every sector. It means that uh, at those plans will secure pensions for workers who are of pensionable age or, or a bridge to, to uh, pensions for slightly younger workers who make the choice to retire. It will secure income support, skills support and redeployment redeple support for those workers who may be displaced or indeed simply changing uh, jobs within the same industry. We also know it's about community renewal. We can't have stranded communities and we can't have stranded people. But I wanted to say that the story is very clear. Europe led by agreements with employers and unions in Germany, Spain and other nations are committed to a green deal with just transition underpinned by a social pillar of rights. Canada's made a start and the US has absolutely made it clear that uh, climate action is necessary, but it must generate jobs, good jobs, union jobs. And indeed, 
in this context, the UK can harness these and other G7 uh, countries that uh, to make sure that the G7 puts climate, yes, but also just transition in a priority position from the outcome of this year's uh, meeting. That's a fantastic start to the lead up to COP and the Secretary of State referenced that. Finally, the good news is, the good news for uh, uh, countries and their economies is that for every dollar, euro or unit of uh, transition, there are jobs. 10 jobs in renewable generates five to 10 jobs in supply chains and up to three times that in economies where workers with decent work spend their wages. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we need resilience and care is vital to that. So investing in healthcare, aged care, childcare and education is a foundation for transition. And the good news again is that there are even more jobs numerically in investment in care as we build livable caring communities. So finally, we have the technology to get the job done. We have the finance if we share it with developing countries on top of that vital debt relief. If we do this, we will win the race. But we need both ambition and the commitment to just transition with social dialogue in all the NDCs as we head towards COP. The bad news is only 25% of the NDCs are ambitious enough to date. There are only 13% that reference social dialogue and only 8% just transition. We need all nations to do better than that because it's absolutely true that there simply are no jobs on a dead planet and together we must now all take responsibility to build good jobs on indeed a living uh, planet for the future for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Francis. Thank you so much, Sharon. In fact, we've got um, quite a bit of time for questions and answers. Uh, and I know that people will be keen to get their questions in. Um, I have to say from a personal point of view, I'm going to be a bit provocative and just say, you know, I know there are lots of working people who are quite cynical when they hear, uh, you know, news of big number, new green jobs, a new green deal, but they don't feel it in their own workplaces or see it in their communities. And we know that kind of winning public support and workers support is key to getting the transition that we need to see. And in fact, Rohan uh, put in a question talking about that at an international level. He says so many regions in the G7 rely on extractive jobs. How will geographical inequalities be taken into account when creating new green jobs? So uh, both at a domestic level and at an international level, how can we really uh, build confidence that this is real? Can I, can I start with Kwasi on that? Yeah, sure. Look, I, I fully accept that uh, for many people, uh, this seems very abstract. And it doesn't really uh, affect the lives. That's the perception of uh, working people. But on the other hand, I would say that a lot of this investment is real. I mean, I was lucky enough, uh, Francis, uh, to go to Teesside just a few weeks ago, uh, where GE uh, made a commitment of 142 million pounds uh, to build a factory which is going to build uh, wind turbines. Uh, and those wind turbines are being built by local people. Um, and actually, the local press was full of this announcement. Uh, and that was a very tangible uh, area where investment in green uh, uh, technology, in this case, offshore wind, was actually uh, recognized by the community and people were excited about it. The same is true when I went to uh, 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 Siemens Gamisa, who make a similar wind turbine in Hull. I mean, these things are happening. These investments are happening and people can see, local people can see the effects of uh, this investment. You just need to go to a place like Lowestoft, which traditionally uh, was a fishing uh, uh, village, a uh, fishing town. It's now morphed into a center uh, of offshore wind power. And there are lots of jobs, new jobs that have been created in that. So I think you're right to say that for many people, uh, this does seem abstract. Uh, and it doesn't seem that connected to their lives. 
But what I'm suggesting is that actually there's another story where, um, you know, actual investment in green technologies, actual uh, manufacturing skills, all of these things are actually tangibly making a difference now. And our job in, in government is to try and uh, spread uh, that opportunity and, and, and increase that investment. Uh, and I think there's a real opportunity uh, to do that. Thank you, Kwasi. Um, Sharon, uh, you know, as I said, people feeling perhaps, you know, jobs are created not always in the places where they're lost and a bit of a sense of are we being conditioned to accept big job losses without having those guarantees of just transition in place? Well, that's the central question, Francis, and indeed uh, that's why the union movement, as you well know, fights so hard for just transition and for the plans to make it real. There's uh, absolutely no question that trust is broken. Francis is right and it's been acknowledged, of course, uh, quasi by yourself. We need to have people involved in planning for a future. You know, we've always had job transitions. We've had uh, the same industries with different transitions. You know, I'm old enough to have friends who went to good jobs in the tele, uh, telephone or uh, telephony sector where you used to plug in the the, um, the plugs into little holes to direct the lines. And, of course, that they were good union jobs, but they don't exist anymore. And now, of course, people think it's all about extractives. It's also about services, telecommunications, data, uh, um, uh, servers, etc., take up huge swathes of uh, land for and, and energy. So we need to make sure every sector has part of this. And you're absolutely right, Francis, about communities, which is why one of our focus is cities. Because if you map the demand and supply, whether it's energy, whether it's agriculture, whether it's manufacturing, we can start to create the relationship and the synergies across investment but community renewal has to be on the table or people won't trust that there's a future in sustainability and that's why i avoid green and brown jobs i think the future economy has to be based on sustainability full stop sue pick up on that point internationally and the risk you know that some may fear uh, this agenda could end up entrenching inequalities rather than levelling up. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and I was reading recently a survey done last year of um, oil and gas workers in Scotland by Friends of the Earth Scotland, Greenpeace and others. And shockingly, 90% of workers hadn't heard of the, the um, term just transition. So I think it's really crucial, um, as has already been noted, to... Um, in, you know, include and have participatory policy making. Um, certainly from an international perspective, the most successful programs that operate are those where decision making is pushed down to the lowest level. So you, you tap into local expertise, local knowledge. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think there are principles and values should that be applied to this, the just transition as well. And, and to um, have those conversations as early as possible to, for, for that reassurance. Because um, I, you know, that that question on regional inequalities is is a is a difficult challenge. Um, so there is the um, importance of government incentivising businesses to move into the areas that perhaps might need assistance most. Um, to pick up on this, but I've also got a specific question for you from Rosa, uh, where she thanks you for the great presentation. But whether you could say a bit more about how unions' recommendations on a just transition have it actually influenced the Canadian government's actions, and um, whether new green jobs created in Canada, um, you know, whether you can point to how many, how many new green jobs as a result of the government's engagement with unions. Sure, thank you, Francis, and thank you, Rosa, for your question. Um, 
certainly uh, leading up to and then in response to the our task force, the Just Transition Task Force work, the government um, allocated $180 million to supporting coal communities uh, in this transition um, uh, through regional economic development agencies. Um, uh, coming out of that, there have been a number of transition centers um, um, opened locally. Uh, certainly in Canada, coal communities are often uh, quite remote. And, um, uh, and so uh, having some of those resources in those communities to help these communities reinvent themselves is really, really critical. Um, As I said, that you know, there's still work to be done on on the worker-focused uh, income supports, transition supports for those affected workers. There's still, that's still a work in progress. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our uh, recent federal budget that was introduced um, uh, because that is the most um, current sort of set of commitments from government. Um, we have seen uh, uh, the the budget 2021 uh, promises investments of 2.5 billion dollars in skills training, that includes a commitment to creating 500,000 training and work experience opportunities for young and core age workers over five years. Um, that's important, certainly. Um, uh, and then I. Um, one of the, the the pieces that I think Sharon alluded to, and I think is important, this budget commits nearly thirty billion dollars in early learning and childcare funding over five years, um, uh, promising Canadians will have access to childcare costing on average of ten dollars a day by twenty twenty five. So that you know, when we start to think a little bit more broadly about what low carbon jobs include, certainly investment in the care sector uh, is really critical. And I think it you know, all we know what access to affordable quality childcare does to women's participation in the workforce. Um, so uh, to you know to see that that promise come to fruition will be really critical. Thanks so much. Um, Quasi, you're going to be first up on the next poll. If you like, of one of our average uh, shop stewards on the shop floor who might say, you know, it's um important infrastructure pro uh, projects in the UK that will generate skilled jobs and we know that's true in automotive or offshore wind and so on but there are an awful lot of jobs in the so-called green economy from what one of my uh, fellow union leaders called loft lagging uh, to uh, recycling that are minimum wage jobs or barely above with poor conditions. So the idea that all new green jobs are, you know, uh, skilled, well paid and good conditions isn't what many people experience. And I guess it would be good to hear what's what your take on that is and what your plan is to ensure that every job, every new green job is a good job. Look, I think that's a fair uh, observation. I mean, it's quite right to say that not all uh, the jobs in the transition are going to be um, highly paid jobs. Um, having said that, I think what we need to do is to give uh, protections uh, to all uh, workers. I mean, I've been very clear about this, that the model, the business model, the, the opportunity of net zero is really to try and drive up uh, the skills, uh, the productivity, and also ultimately the wages of our workers. It's not about a race uh, to the bottom or a, a kind of dystopian, uh, you know, uber laissez-faire um, model. I think, I think that's, that was from a, for, for a different era. And I think that uh, what we're gonna try and do is create a, uh, an economy where people can have entry level jobs where they don't necessarily um, earn a huge amount of money, but they can progress through uh, skills, through training, uh, to, to, to better pay jobs within the green economy. I think there are huge opportunities for that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, in terms of you know, driving up economic opportunity in the green uh, economy, that's one of the reasons why it sits so neatly uh, with the levelling up agenda, because what, what's happening, and I mentioned you know, offshore wind, uh, wind turbine manufacturers in Hull, uh, now in Teesside, What's happening is that um, huge amounts of uh, investment is going into places where uh, they haven't seen as much investment uh, recently. 
um, and it's giving people a lot more opportunity. So people will be able to enter a, uh, a job, maybe not earn a huge amount of money, but hopefully over time uh, they can they can they can upskill, um, and and it gives them uh, the workers the opportunity to really make a, a, an impact and have a, have a very productive uh, and meaningful professions. Thank you, Kwasi. I mean, we heard from Sharon just how important uh, in that just transition and social dialogue is, and that, frankly, you know, not everybody's playing fair on this. Uh, clearly, the UK government has a critical role this year as host. But what more do you think you can do to make sure that every G7 member makes that public commitment to just transition lying at the heart of what they do? I think that's a very, uh, uh, that's a fair point. I mean, all I would say on that is that we've we've made a huge amount of progress, certainly this year. I mean, I was very pleased uh, in the first months of my appointment uh, to meet John Kerry, who is the climate change ambassador uh, for the new uh, Biden administration. I also met uh, virtually uh, Jennifer Granholm, who's the secretary uh, for energy and um, and what struck me was that they are fully committed uh, in the United States uh, to what we're talking about to uh, reducing carbon emissions they've just uh, committed to reducing them by 50% in 2030 um, and this is a complete contrast uh, to the previous administration so there's a real opportunity I think uh, to build an international alliance on this and that's what we'll be seeking to build on in COP26. And I think the point um, uh, that I think it was Sue made about the just transition not being well known or not being something that people, a phrase that people are familiar with. I think we all have a job in trying to uh, talk about it. I mean, I know that the government talks about the green economy uh, building back better uh, all the time, but we need to just do that more. And, and make more people aware of what's happening and what we want to do. And that's something which we'll be working with G7 colleagues uh, and internationally in COP26, we'll be, we'll be uh, encouraging uh, partners, uh, partner countries, uh, that message domestically and abroad. Is that music to your ears, Sharon? And can I say that if the G7 really come out with, you know, the strength in a united fashion to action within their own backyards, of course, in their nations, working with workers and their unions and employers, but also look to the solidarity it will take internationally to share international uh, 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 intellectual property, to make sure that Africa, Latin America and Asia are not left behind, then I think this will be a, a terrific year. We saw, I thought, good momentum from the Biden summit last week and your own uh, role in that. And now we need to actually see it through COP because it will take all of us. We didn't mention, Francis, the fact that as we transition heavy industry you know, like steel, and I know how difficult this is, but like aluminium, cement, other industries and manufacturing, we will need to think about what's the balance between border adjustment, between more broadly uh, global uh, WTO and trade reform, and indeed that sharing of uh, technology and finance support to make sure everybody can actually have the ambition engage with the, their communities, with workers and employers, and get transition plans, just transition plans in place. That's a really important point, Sharon. Tara, can you tell us a little bit more about the companies, the iconic of industry, like, uh, and certainly in this country, uh, you know, we saw a devastation of that industry. What were the critical put in place to uh, achieve a just transition for coal miners in Canada of how well that was done? Sure. Well, you know, um, Canada is a, a 
big country geographically and this transition away from coal is happening uh, along different timelines in different parts of the country. So, you know, parts of the country are well into this, this um, shift away. Uh, uh, plants are transitioning uh, into other other things, um, mines are closing, and so they're really more in the thick of it. Where in other parts of the country, the the timeline is going to be much closer to the 2030 deadline for actually seeing these shifts. Um, you know, we will, as I said, we you know we've seen some real commitments around um, regional economic development to try to help these communities sort of reinvent, find their next act, which will be really important for these workers. Many of these workers. Um, uh, you know, uh, work in the plants and the mines, but they also run family farms and they, you know, essentially use their income from the plant or the mine to help subsidize that family farm. And so they are connected to their communities. They want their communities to, to survive and thrive. Um, so that will be critical. Um, but for these workers, they, you know, many of them uh, have worked in these, uh, worked for the same employer for their whole working life. And so in some cases it is not, been in their employer's interest to give them accreditation for the skills they already have because that would give them papers that they could take to another employer. But now that we know that this uh, industry has a has a deadline, uh, it will be important to help these workers um, get accreditation for some of the skills they already have while they're on the job so that they have uh, some ability to shorten the time between employment. So that will be a key piece of it. Um, there are some workers that are close to retirement but may, but may not be able to access their pension without huge penalties and so making sure that there is some ability to bridge those workers to pension they've worked their whole lives you know building the prosperity of our country in many ways um they are they are entitled to a, a dignified retirement that is critical um Workers, the you know what we heard again and again in this from the workers when we went to talk to them was that they they want new good jobs. They they don't necessarily want to leave their community. Certainly, the towns were quite fearful that if the, these coal workers left their town, that that would put them into a bit of a spiral um, as they lose not only these these sort of essential these critical workers, but also um, the people who would leave with their families, the teachers, the pharmacists, the nurses, the volunteer firefighters, the all of that. So um, uh, finding a way to help these workers, access, you know, uh, find new jobs, uh, either close to home, or in some cases, allow, give them some ability, some, some transitional support, uh, if they have to travel for work. Um, so that will be, you know, that and, and those individual uh, supports for workers, um, it's a little more tricky in a federated country, uh, but we do need to get to a place where we can strike agreements between levels of government with workers at the table shaping those supports um, to, to put those supports in the workers' hands. Because I think, as Sharon has said, and you alluded to, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got just a few minutes, so I've got one last question uh, that I'd like to put to Kwasi and to Sharon. Um, you know, clearly there are big challenges on two fronts. One, um, building domestic supply chains, whether it's building EV batteries or offshore wind uh, fan, uh, factories. We, you know, we need to uh, reverse that trend we've seen to towards offshore shoring uh, green domestic supply chains. Um, and uh, it's been pointed out to me that one of the benefits of not procuring solar panels built with forced labor in China uh, would, you know, would also be very welcome. But that kind of raises two issues really. How, you know, and I know that this is not easy and simple, but how do we rebuild those domestic supply chains? You know, that to me sounds like a 10 or 20 year plan that needs broad consensus, not just, uh, it's not just gonna be sorted in a couple of years. And secondly, how do we use government procurement power, which is huge, uh, to help us do that. And that is something that we could be kind of acting on more quickly. So Kwasi and then Sharon, and I'm really sorry, we've got about one and a half minutes each. Yeah, two <laughs> things there. I'll be very brief if I can. I mean, in terms of the supply chain, I don't think it takes decades. I mean, one of the things we've tried to do in the offshore wind sector is as part of the sector deal, 
as you probably know, Francis, we've said that 60% of the uh, supply chain should be UK, UK content. And one of the things that we're doing ahead of the fourth auction round uh, for um, contract for difference round in terms of the offshore uh, wind uh, industry is trying to hold uh, some of the, the players' uh, feet to the fire on uh, making sure that we can build uh, a supply chain. And that's precisely why um, we encouraged and we saw success in bringing GE investment to Teesside. That's all about building uh, manufacturing here in the UK and supplying, in this case, uh, wind turbines uh, to offshore wind uh, installations. So <clears throat> we're, we're, we're working hard to try and increase UK content. I think on government procurement, uh, you ask a very interesting question, and that's something which you know we're discussing within uh, government uh, about how you know we've got a whole range of uh, infrastructure projects, um, some of which uh, require a great deal of steel, for example. And there is a question about how we can uh, help uh, uh, you know our industries through the government, government procurement process. You will know that in the United States uh, that that is frequently uh, the case. Uh, and we're looking in Britain uh, at our procurement uh, processes. So Francis, you've hit, the, you've hit the nail on the head. We must have a commitment to jobs everywhere. And if you're gonna transition all of those industries, then public procurement's vital, but so too are areas of local content, border adjustment, and that's why I say that's perfectly legitimate. And technology is also allowing us to onshore jobs. But at the same time, sharing the knowledge, sharing intellectual property, so every country, developed country, can do the same with the support they need will be vital to get us to win the climate race, but also the jobs race. And that's what just transition will mean. That is fantastic and thank you so much for your brilliant contributions, uh, great questions from the audience too. Uh, thank you again and we keep working for that. Thank you. And just <clears throat> thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Vale, esto yo creo que ya no está, ¿no? Ya no te llamo, mira la... Sí, sí, sí.